Good news everybody, today's video is brought to you by Shaker and Spoon, which provides one of the greatest services of any YouTube sponsor ever. They help you make great craft cocktails from the comfort of your own home. It's not much that beats that. Each month, Shaker and Spoon send you a box with three original recipes crafted by world-class bartenders. You just provide one bottle of alcohol, depending on the theme of your box. Rum, vodka, bourbon, etc. I believe this one is actually Anya, which is a uh, type of tequila, right? And Shaker and Spoon give you everything else. And when I say everything else, I really do mean it. You've got your syrups, you've got your little bitters, you've got uh, even this, this pink grapefruit mixer, which is going to be used. There's also a coconut mixer in here. There are so many tiny little bottles of everything that it's uh, it's it's a lot of stuff even even more syrups. It's everything you need to make a unique quality cocktail without having to spend hours at the grocery store. Each box contains enough for 12 cocktails or four from each recipe. With Shaker and Spoon, there's no need to seek out hard to find ingredients or buy full size bottles of things which you end up only using once. It's a super convenient alternative for a little upscale home treat. And on top of that, if you feel like you're always drinking the same sort of basic drinks, it's a great resource to learn some additional drink ideas for the future. So if you think you'd enjoy some more complex drinks with very simple, easy to follow instructions or if you know someone else in your life you might enjoy this try out shaker and spoon right now you guys can get twenty dollars off the cost of a box by going to shakerandspoon.com slash brain food again shakerandspoon.com slash brain food twenty dollars off the cost of one box it's one of my favorite sponsors go give them a go and now today's video Here's one of the world's most recognizable corporate emblems, a bulky, smiley figure made up of white automobile tires. Here's the Michelin Man, mascot of the second largest tire manufacturer in the world, an arbiter of restaurant quality all around the world. So iconic is this character that comparing someone to the Michelin Man is universally understood as a jab against their girth or the bulkiness of their clothes. But while you have doubtless heard of the Michelin Man, did you know that he actually has a name? And if not, what do you suppose that name is? Pierre-Louis Jacques, perhaps? Well, if you guessed, Bibendum, then congratulations. You either cheated on the quest or you possess a remarkable gift for clairvoyance and should probably go buy that lottery ticket. So how on earth did the Michelin Man acquire such a bizarre name? Who came up with the iconic mascot in the first place? And how did a tire manufacturer get into the business of raiding restaurants? So let's find out as we dive into the surprisingly broad cultural impact of one of France's largest companies. The Michelin Company was founded in 1899 by brothers Edouard and André Michelin, who ran a rubber products business in Clermont-Ferrand in central France. This being before automobiles were in common use, the company initially specialised in the production of tyres for bicycles, while various proto-bicycles like the pedalless Dressine or the Dandy Horse and the giant-wheeled Penny Farthing had been around for nearly a century. It was not until the invention in the 1880s of the safety bicycle, with wheels of equal sizes and a chain drive, that the sport of cycling really took off. And we mean took off. In the 1890s, France, along with much of Europe, was gripped by a cycling craze that forever changed multiple facets of society, from fashion and women's rights to popular culture, science, and even warfare. And more on the surprisingly outsized impact of cycling on history, please do check out our previous video, How Bicycles Caused the Downfall of the British Empire. Now, according to Michelin Company law, the Michelin brothers' first encounter with the booming industry that would soon make their fortune took place in 1889 when a cyclist with a punctured tyre showed up at the factory seeking repairs. At the time, pneumatic bicycle tyres, which had only been introduced the year before by Scottish inventor John Boyd Dunlop, were glued to the rim and it took over three hours to remove, repair and reattach the tyre, plus a whole night for the glue to dry. Then despite all this work, the next day the bicycle managed to roll only a few hundred metres before the tyre failed once again. Convinced that there had to be a better way, on May the 28th, 1889, the brothers incorporated the Michelin Tire Company and set about developing a new kind of bicycle tyre that could be easily removed and reattached to the rim, a design they perfected and patented two years later in 1891. That same year, cyclist Charles Tarrant used Michelin tyres to win the world's first long-distance bicycle race between Paris and Brest, bringing the company's product to national attention and causing sales to skyrocket. Michelin would go on to dominate the vehicle tyre industry for more than a century and introduce several major innovations in the field including the pneumatic automobile tyre in 1895, the run-flat tyre in 1934, and the steel-reinforced radial tyre in 1946. It was not until 10 years after its founding, however, that the company would acquire its iconic mascot. In 1894, the Michelin brothers were attending the Colonial Exposition in Lyon when they noticed a stack of tyres that resembled the figure of a man. Four years later, André Michelin had a chance encounter with famous French cartoonist Marius Roussillon, best known by his pen name Ogalop, who showed him a rejected image he had created for a Munich brewery, the figure of King Gambrinus, patron saint of brewers, holding up a glass of beer and quoting the
the phrase nunc est bibendum, now is the time for drinking, from Roman poet Horace's odes. Michelin, recalling his observation at the Lyon Exposition four years earlier, immediately suggested replacing the figure with a man made of rubber tires and an advertising icon was born. The Michelin Man made his first appearance in an 1898 poster designed by Ogala, in which the character, flanked by ugly, deformed rubber figures caricaturing the heads of competitors Dunlop and Continental, hoists a champagne goblet filled with nails, shards, and broken glass, and other sharp objects, and declares, Nunc est bibendum, that is, to your health. Michelin Tars, drink up obstacles. The company uh, would use this basic poster design for nearly 15 years, continuously updating the items on the table in front of the mascot to reflect its current product line. The same year as his introduction, the Michelin Man also booked his first and only speaking gig when Andre Michelin set up a cardboard cutout of the character at the Paris Cycle Show and hired a cabaret comedian to crouch behind it and engage in witty banter with passing visitors. The gimmick was so successful that competing vendors became enraged and tried to disperse the crowd gathered around the Michelin booth, leading to police being called in to break up the ensuing riot. Since then, the character has largely remained silent. It's not known exactly when Bibendum was officially adopted as the Michelin Man's name, but the most commonly accepted year is 1908, when Michelin commissioned food critic Maurice Saillard, better known by his pen name Konoski, to write a regular column under that name in an Italian newspaper. Early versions of Bibendum differed slightly from his modern incarnation being made of thinner bicycle tires rather than the fatter automobile tires he is known for today. His iconic white color reflects the tires sold at the time, of his creation, which were typically the off-white or beige color of natural latex rubber. In 1912, tire manufacturers began adding carbon black to tire rubber as a preservative and strengthening agent, creating the black look that we're familiar with today. For a time, Michelin made Bibendum black to match their products, but this version did not show up well in print ads, and his color soon reverted to white. In earlier ads, Bibendum was also commonly depicted wearing pince-nez glasses and smoking a cigar to reflect the wealthy upper-class customers of early autumn automobiles, affections which were gradually phased out as motoring was increasingly embraced by the masses. Over the decades, Vivendum has appeared in all sorts of weird and wonderful guises, including a medieval knight, gladiator, a kickboxer, a helpful roadside repairman, a ballroom dancer, a memoirist, and even a rakish ladies' man, all in the service of emphasizing the toughness and luxurious ride of Michelin tires. And in more recent years, he's gone from fat and awkward to slimmer and athletic, from a mummy-like and slightly sinister to a rounder, softer and cuddlier, and in American ads has even gained a pet dog named Bubbles. Naturally, Bubbles is also made out of white tires. This adaptability has allowed Vivendum to survive the test of time and become one of the oldest corporate mascots in continuous use, only beaten out by the likes of the Quaker Oats Pilgrim and Aunt Jemima. The longevity has in turn allowed Vivendum to become one of the most universally recognized and beloved trademarks in the world, with a jury of 22 of the world's top designers and advertising executives awarding him the title of greatest logo in history in the year 2000. According to Edward Mitchell, Michelin, great-grandson of the company co-founder of the same name and Michelin CEO from 1999 to 2006, the mascot's success lies in his unique design and perceived personableness, stating, He's much more than an advertising tool or corporate logo. He has lived through the whole history of the automobile. That gives him a status beyond any other type of corporate logo. He's alive. No, really. Not bad for a character inspired by a trade show display and an obscure piece of ancient Roman poetry. But the Michelin Company is known for far more than just tires, and giving us yet another colorful metaphor for obesity. Around the world, the dream of every restaurateur is to earn a coveted Michelin star, with three stars being the holy grail of culinary achievement. So coveted is this honor, in fact, that when his restaurant, The London, lost its two Michelin stars in 2014, famously, celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay he actually broke down and cried. But how did a tire company come to be the global arbiter of culinary taste? Well, regular viewers of this channel will probably not be surprised to learn that it has all to do with the age-old business goal of boosting demand for one's products. In the year 1900, a little more than a decade after the Michelin Company was founded, uh, there were still fewer than 3,000 cars on the roads of France, the machines still being largely playthings for the ultra-wealthy. In order to increase demand for automobiles, and thus its tires, the company introduced the first of its famous Michelin guides. In addition to detailed maps of the French countryside, the first Michelin guides included instructions on tire repair and replacement, as well as extensive listings of repair garages, gas stations, hotels, restaurants, tourist attractions, and other points of interest across the country. 35,000 were printed in the first run and distributed for free. The campaign proved a massive hit, and by 1911, Michelin had translated the guides into multiple languages and expanded their coverage across Europe and even to the then-French colonies of Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria in North Africa. 
America. The publication of the Michelin Guide was suspended due to the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, but resumed shortly after the 1918 armistice. In 1920, Andre Michelin, while visiting a tire vendor, noticed one of his guides being used to prop up a workbench leg. Reasoning that a man only truly respects what he pays for, Michelin decided to stop giving away the guide for free and began charging a nominal price of 750 francs, around $2.15 today. Michelin also removed advertisements from the guide and arranged the restaurant listings into district categories. In 1926, realizing that the restaurant listings were by far the most popular part of the guide, Michelin began hiring anonymous critics to review fine dining establishments across France and assign them a star rating. At first, only a single star was awarded for exceptional quality, but in 1936, Michelin introduced its now standard three-star system, with one star indicating a very good restaurant in its category, two stars indicating excellent cooking worth a detour, and three stars indicating exceptional cuisine worth a special journey. Given the prestigious nature of Michelin stars, from the beginning great pains were taken to preserve the anonymity and objectivity of Michelin food critics who were forbidden to speak to journalists or reveal their line of work even to their families, and whose travel and expenses are fully paid for by the company. With the outbreak of the Second World War, publication of the regular Michelin Guide was once again suspended, though in the lead-up to the D-Day invasion in 1944, special copies of the 1939 edition were published for the Allied military forces as it contained the most accurate maps of Europe then available. Publication resumed shortly after VE Day in 1945, and in the post-war years, the Michelin Guide continued to adapt to the changing times. For example, when widespread food shortages led to a drop in restaurant quality across Europe, Michelin temporarily changed its maximum rating from three stars to two, while in 1955, recognizing that prices at most Michelin-starred restaurants were beyond the means of ordinary diners, it began listing establishments featuring exceptionally good food at moderate prices, a feature known as the Bib Gourmand. And in 2020, the company introduced used green stars to recognize excellence in sustainable and environmentally friendly cuisine. More than a century after its introduction, the Michelin Guide is still in print, being offered in two different versions, the classic Red Guides and the Green Guides, which provide general travel information for specific countries, regions, and cities. The Red Guides are available in 14 editions covering 23 different countries, making them among the world's preeminent travel and restaurant guides. Meanwhile, the Michelin Star System remains the most coveted and exclusive culinary award in the world, with legendary chef Paul Bocuse declaring in the 1960s that Michelin is the only guide that counts. Indeed, in France, the announcement of each year's listings is treated as a major event on par with the Academy Awards, with critics and media outlets enthusiastically speculating on which restaurants will gain or lose a star. As of this recording, there are only 2,651 Michelin-starred restaurants worldwide, 2,160 with one star, 385 with two stars, and 106 with the coveted three stars. The country with the most Michelin-starred restaurants is, big surprise, France, with 628, followed by Japan with 577, Italy with 374, Germany with 307, the United States with 169, while the chef with the most starred restaurants is France's Alain Ducasse. So important have Michelin stars become to culinary tourism that countries will pay through the nose to have their own Michelin guide printed. For instance, in 2016, the Korean tourism organization reportedly paid the equivalent of $1.8 million for a Michelin guide of South Korea. Then in 2018, Thailand paid a whopping $4.4 million. Unsurprisingly, such practices have led critics to accuse Michelin of corruption, while the company's marked bias towards French star cuisine have for decades earned it accusations of culinary nationalism. But given that the whole system was created by a French company a hundred years ago to sell French automobile tars in France, one has to wonder just what the critics were really expecting here.